What I want to do is, is uh, talk a little bit about the fact that sepsis knows no boundaries. It doesn't sense whether it's in the ICU, in the emergency department, at home. It happens where it happens. And how do we think about where that care should be occurring? You, you spoke about bringing the care to the patient. And what I'd like to focus on <coughs> is maybe not even the emergency department, but resuscitation without walls. How do we resuscitate children uh, in a manner that we can bring the care they need to where they are and then bring them to where that can continue. I have no relevant conflicts in this, but as you heard, there are really goal-directed therapies that depend on the patient, what we know, and how that gets processed, taught, learned, remembered, and done, and done well, and how that then impacts in how we measure the outcomes and the important outcomes, really, of intact neurologic survival and quality of life. How do we get them back to their usual function? And to do that, we've heard about how protocols help, but where and how should they work? In resource-limited systems, we have a number of public health initiatives that get applied to the masses, but the critical care resources are very small, and safe deliveries, pneumonia and sepsis, and diarrhea are major contributors to under five mortality in these settings. If we think about the programs that exist to sort of address those tiers and where that training is occurring, we can see that there are some screening techniques, there's some early interventions that are embedded in our World Health Organization programs, and the Helping Babies Breathe program and neonatal resuscitation programs are addressing and making impact in neonatal or newly born uh, problems where a lot of the problems lie. But that really there is a big sector, 25% of children presenting to an ambulatory care center in developing countries are seriously ill, and 70% of in-hospital deaths occur within the first 48 hours. So the time sequence, the time of intervention is very critical. And 20%, only 20% of deaths occur in tertiary facilities. So if we're going to make an impact, we have to treat sepsis where it's occurring, whether it's a developing or a resource-rich country. And so this pocket, this quarter of childhood deaths could be perhaps addressed and treated if we could do resuscitation without walls with early goal-directed therapies. And we know that our transport systems and our transport teams are often not well equipped, that even if the providers in a community or district hospital are able to provide the care to get them to the next level, frequently they go down a level, they get put in a transport with very little ongoing care until they reach the tertiary care center where we can continue that, that therapy. 16% of acutely ill children died during the attempt to seek care. So we have a lot of room for improvement. We know that in the past 50 years, we've made tremendous advances in the treatment of many conditions, including pediatric septic shock, leukemia, HIV, congenital heart disease, etc. We've gone from about a 5% survival to about a 5% mortality. <coughs> we flipped that scale in centers with resources and applications that across the system of care can deal with these entities. But it isn't really, um, if you look along septic shock, the survival from septic shock, fluid septic shock, uh, was particularly poor when they reached the ICU until sort of intraosseous infusions came back and the recognition in the early 90s that early effective volume resuscitation in the developed countries could make a difference. And it took a long time, it took another 15 years until that was implemented, and in centers that are implementing it effectively have brought that survival now to 97%, whereas before there was high mortality. So there is hope that we can uh, achieve those goals. Now, uh, in developing countries, we know that there are programs, essential newborn care, trauma training, that have been shown to decrease mortality over time within a short time period so that if we can take some of these protocols that we just heard about and if we can effectively implement them, there is evidence 
that perhaps we can make a dent in sepsis care in the same way. But let's take a moment first to just uh, agree or sort of uh, define those things that need to happen. We need early recognition of shock, vascular access, and appropriate fluids. Appropriate fluids in light of the, main, the main, uh, Maitland article, right? Um, restoration of perfusion and oxygenation, early antibiotics, early goal-directed therapy, and a safe transition or transport to definitive critical care for management of secondary organ injury. If we look at these tenets, if we look at these principles that permeate whatever sepsis guidelines you follow, then you could say it really, nothing is ever mentioned about the location of that care, that ICU or ER or home or community center should be the location. It's just that we need to figure out a way to get this type of care and you heard some of the challenges of early recognition. And in addition to those therapies, in addition to these therapies being important, it's not just that they get done, but in every case, in every sepsis report you look at, the timing, the intensity, the duration, and the variability of the care of that particular entity plays a critical role. So defined by where we are on the spectrum of the progression of the septic process should really define the interventions. So one protocol is not going to fit every situation. We have to be able to titrate it to the timing, intensity, duration, and variability of the septic event itself. Sepsis is complicated. There are many, many, many different systems, biologic systems that are effective that we have to block, change, augment, and titrate but we don't have to do all of those things at once. We know that in any global <coughs> tissue hypoxia and ischemic insult, there's a defined sequence that is occurring. If you look at mediators and apoptosis and necrosis and inflammation, that there is a sequence that's going on that we have to figure out where we are and how to treat it most effectively. It can be complicated, but perhaps Manny Rivers, with his adult sepsis protocols, with some very specific targeted therapies has shown us that even for desperately ill adults in this case, a goal-directed protocol can be implemented prior to ICU care that has ICU elements like venous saturation monitoring and like tight glycemic control and vasoactive infusion that can be implemented in settings, in this case in the emergency department, and make a difference in outcome. We do know that we have a problem with compliance. This was Betsy Hunt's study in 35 emergency departments in North Carolina. She took a simulated child, a computerized simulator, and plunked it down, admitted it to those emergency departments, and measured the numbers of errors that were made in the care of that simple child with septic shock. And what she discovered was that their child weight estimates, their preparation of intraosseous, their IV fluid bolus and their glucose bolus calculations were frequently, you can see very frequently, wrong. Frequently not within guidelines. And so as you've heard in the previous presentation and here, our ability to affect change in the emergency department type of settings has a lot of room for improvement, but it can be done. Inside our hospitals, perhaps, is more dangerous than in our ERs. We know that from rapid recognition and rapid response teams, met teams, et cetera, that recognizing the individual at risk can be quite complex. It's like finding a needle in the haystack. And so getting better at assessing individual risk of recognizing and judging the severity of the deterioration and then dispatching a team or individuals who are trained to deal with it has been successful in every system that has studied it. And so we can make a difference in this early recognition problem that you heard about. We know that shock in developing countries is hard to find. Here's one of the reports from 2004 that took 100 consecutive children and tried to get an inter-rated reliability for these common signs of capillary refill, temperature gradient, pulse volume. And you can see that the K values are very low, that our ability to assess and communicate simple measures of shock is quite limited. So we have to perhaps use innovative tools to do a better job of coming to that. And we know that once found, 
that the problem is not so similar to adults who have vascular failure, but frequently these problems for children manifest themselves as myocardial failure as opposed to vascular failure. But the principles of resuscitation are the same from child to adult and also from location to location, community to ER to ICU. The monitoring and control of the four things, preload, contractility, afterload, and heart rate, are all the same principles of management and are not hard or difficult. They're not complex concepts. So figuring out what is the preload, contractility, afterload, and heart rate that we should be targeting or managing can be taught and learned in the pre-hospital setting. And it's not so hard. We check the plumbing, we check the function, we check the circuits, and then we check the rate and rhythm. And we have simple interventions that can address each one. And so measuring the adequacy of resuscitation as we would do in the complex ICU setting is quite good, but we can incrementally add on those things that are simple to measure, capillary refill, etc., and then get com increased complexity like lactate, near infrared spectroscopy, ultrasound, etc., as those tools become available along the system. Our resuscitation algorithms are not also so complex, just getting vascular access and fluid in the first few minutes of implementing a few simple things that will drive whether we start vasoactive agents or not, and then getting increasingly complex as we reach the ICU and can titrate to more sophisticated measures. As we move through, we know that there are examples where critical care without walls has been elegantly implemented to affect survival outcome here, showing uh, decreased mortality and improved survival when simple measures were implemented and implemented effectively. We now have a system. We now have, as you know, in the um, different organizations, by assessing where we are and where septic children lie and how they're being managed, we can perhaps come up with better protocols. This sepsis prevalence outcomes and therapies point prevalence study is uh, promoted through WIFPIX has been uh, helpful in starting to define where the septic children are, what condition they're in when they arrive in the ICU, and what the course of action is as they leave it. One size is not going to fit all, but the principles of assessment, monitoring, feedback, teamwork, quality, and outcome are all the same. We have to get better at applying the principles of goal-directed therapy, where sepsis is, and where the children lie. We know that the resources compared to the level of care are inverted pyramids. And so getting that match, finding out where those overlaps is, is where we could help. And so as our chain of survival moves forward, as we try to fill the gaps and save children's lives, we have to think about programs that address an initial assessment and training, how we put them into our continuous quality improvement cycle and measure outcomes so that we can move from just educational improvements through process of care and operational performance for those trained, and then start to measure improvements on patients, outcomes, and public health. So with that, I think we are poised and ready to make some pretty important changes and to start to treat these key issues of resuscitation without walls. Thank you.